Good morning and thank you for the invite. The East-West divide in the EU reconsidering skills, pursuing historicization. My colleague Luca Lisa Gabrielcic and I have recently edited a volume under the title The Legacy of Division East and West after 1989. In this presentation, I would like to share some reflections on our project and its main outcomes. I shall focus my remarks on how considering four skills simultaneously can help us reconsider the East-West divide that is so widely debated within the EU today, and on what types of historicization might help us grasp better why East-West tensions have increased in recent years. By way of introduction, let me state that as historians with avid interests in intellectual history and the history of political thought, Luca and I were pondering back in the summer of 2018 what might be the most timely and most exciting question to ask on the 30th anniversary of 1989. We felt that a lot of controversy surrounds how East-West relations in Europe have evolved since the end of the Cold War, and why, after some three decades of the beginnings of Eastern Europe's newest great transformation, the EU has to confront significant tensions between several of its so-called older and so-called newer member states. We were particularly keen on exploring convergences and divergences, and convergences might have taken undesirable shapes, of course, and equally keen on studying the role of perceptions and misperceptions in the evolution of post-Cold War relations and realities. We came to believe that it would be worthwhile to address the broader context of the worsening controversy within the EU in a series of essays to be penned by prominent scholars and public intellectuals having various disciplinary backgrounds, belonging to different generations, and coming from and being based in diverse corners of the globe. Commissioning dozens of contributions, we were eager to foster broad and multidisciplinary explorations and exchanges. Key subjects we wish to address included international relations, political institutional change and economic development, but also historical legacies and identities, gender relations, issues of migration, and last but not least, the possibilities and strategies of dissent. Insisting on a multidisciplinary coverage, we were convinced that the East-West divide within the EU can only be properly understood if embedded in contemporary history and connected to what happened at the end of the Cold War and in its immediate aftermath. Manifold connections across the Iron Curtain notwithstanding, connections that some of our fellow historians have explored in detail in, rec in recent years, the Cold War era divide was clearly reflected in political lives, economic models, military organizations, cultural priorities, possibilities to travel, and so on. Such a divide is, of course, much less clear-cut nowadays. After 1989, the East-West divide in Europe was at first widely believed not only to be of decreasing importance, but perhaps even on the way to irrelevance. The importance of this divide has indeed declined as compared to the Cold War period, but not as swiftly and not nearly as much as many had hoped and expected. From a historical point of view, the first two questions to raise were therefore as follows. What kind of a divide can we observe since the end of the Cold War? And second, why has such an East-West divide, contrary to the intentions declared by both parties in the early post-Cold War years, been reproduced, even if far from fully, over the past three decades? Questions regarding the semantics of the West and Eastern Europe during and since the Cold War had to be directly connected to these questions, of course. Both just mentioned concepts were of central import during the Cold War and were defined in specific ways in those decades. Paradoxically, while facets of the East-West divide are avidly debated in Europe today, 
both these key concepts appear to have entered the crisis of reproduction. As a result of its wholesale westernization, the Eastern Europe, shaped by the Soviet model, was anyhow supposed to be rejected and overcome. Few might have suspected right after 1989 that within just a few decades, the liberal normative project of the West would come to be internally challenged by an anti-universalistic, staunchly right-wing vision of the West. A major reason behind the current crisis of the project that has much to do with the unexpected political evolution of parts of the new West. While our explorations have focused primarily on contemporary Europe, we were acutely aware that the East-West divide within the European Union is no more than one out of at least four potential scales on which post-Cold War divides and the role of historical legacies in shaping them could be discussed. Beyond the so-called older and newer member states of the EU, we thought it would be useful to explore the same questions regarding the enlarged or nominally reunified Federal Republic of Germany, concerning the relations between the West and Russia, and last but not least, address global connections by bringing in the unexpected transformations of the two major global players, the US and China in particular. Thinking about these four scales simultaneously was meant to help us conceptualize the political, social and cultural processes we were interested in. A key insight that has emerged from our explorations is how asymmetrical East-West relations have remained after 1989, with Eastern Europeans much more interested in the other side, as well as the character and evolution of East-West relations than the other way around. Contrary to our original intentions, I should say, our own list of contributors clearly reflects this asymmetry. In other words, all the necessary attention devoted to problematic trends in Orientalism notwithstanding, Occidentalism might in fact have had a much more profound impact in recent decades of European history. After all, as Ivan Krastev has famously pointed out, the relationship between two alternative models was suddenly replaced by a new type of relationship between the imitated, the Western core, and its Occidentalist imitators. The massive and in many ways unprecedented transformations that followed 1989 did not make the East of Europe appear significantly more important or relevant to key actors on the western half of the continent. Despite the grave structural crisis in the East and the unprecedented complexity of its post-89 transformations, the path of Eastern Europe was often assumed to be just about catching up and could thus supposedly teach nothing of true relevance to Westerners. This was the result of a biased and indeed orientalizing perception prevalent in the West, whose origins can be traced back to the Enlightenment and which locates Eastern Europe not only as over there, but also assigns it to the recent past of the truly developed and civilized. At the same time, as Yaroslav Kuish has elaborated in a particularly striking fashion, shortly after 89, many in Eastern Europe shared positive myth rather than realistic assessments of the West. The currently much debated regimes in Poland and Hungary may have adopted religiously or even racially connoted civilizational ideas of the West in an affirmative manner and may thereby aim to undermine the liberal consensus at the heart of the European project. However, when posing this growing challenge, they have arguably only replaced one myth of the West prevalent in Eastern Europe with another, if a much more sinister one. At the same time, the rise of right-wing populism on both sides of where the Iron Curtain used to stand amounts to a key, if highly negative, form of convergence between the former East and the former West.
The other three scales we have addressed have greatly helped us rethink the East-West divide within the EU. If, as several authors in the volume demonstrate, the economically most powerful and perhaps also best functioning so-called post-classical nation-state in Europe, Germany, could overcome the legacies of its Cold War division into two states only partially when it comes to socioeconomic levels of development or types of political culture, why should we then expect the European Union not to have similar East-West differences and gaps three decades after 1989 and a mere 15 years after its Big Bang enlargement? This appears all the less surprising in light of what Dorothy Bole and Bela Greshkovic have argued in their contribution, namely that contrary to what the accession process led many in Eastern Europe to believe and trust, the EU is far from an ultimate guarantor of liberal democratic standards. As Bole and Greshkovic insist, the EU may even have been employed as an apt instrument to consolidate illiberal states. Second, if instead of refounding the West after the Cold War to create a new, greater West that would have included newly independent Russia as well, the historical West has expanded to the exclusion of Russia from the new old security architecture as Richard Sakwa has persuasively claimed, then isn't the most consequential East-West divide in Europe not within the EU, but much rather between that enlarged historical West and Russia? And shouldn't the realization how sharply and misfortunately this dichotomy between the West and Russia has been reinforced in the three decades since the end of the Cold War again with the obvious difference being that Eastern Europe is not supposedly just a part of the enlarged historical West, shouldn't this realization in turn make us more cognizant of the fact that there might still be a continuum from full-fledged democracies and authoritarian states? According to a host of indicators, countries like Hungary or Poland rank somewhere between the Netherlands and France on the one hand and Russia or Turkey on the other. Addressing this question on an all-European scale between the EU European and the global has thus made us wonder whether it isn't still true that the more things change, the more they remain the same when it comes to the European semi-periphery. The global dimension of the transformations, that is to say our fourth scale, has in turn revealed, among others, that Germany and China, two countries where 1989 and its political consequences were of diametrically opposed character, have, at least economically, succeeded the most in the post-Cold War decades. The relationship between the political 1989s and later developments is thus far from straightforward. Such a realization should make us critically question not only the relevance of 1989 as a watershed year in contemporary history, but indeed also the theories of westernization that largely defined the early post-Cold War years. By late 2020, it might be too obvious to require special emphasis that state institutions matter a great deal. It might be more intriguing to consider how Eastern Europe's disappointing recent underperformance might be connected to the fact that its anti-authoritarian revolutions and the Washington consensus on neoliberal transformations played out in tandem, and that in fact Eastern European states pioneered the second, more radical wave of neoliberalism around the turn of the millennium. These insights, in turn, call for two attempts at historicization, at a longer-term one and at a more specific contextual one. The former would help us realize early post-Cold War assertions to the contrary notwithstanding that the differences between Eastern and Western Europe were certainly not just the product of the Cold War, 
Such differences have in fact much deeper historical roots that reach back to the very origins of the modern capitalist economy, were clearly observable before the start of the Cold War and are therefore unlikely to disappear anytime soon. Not to mention that the post-Cold War decades have also been experienced differently and with rather different consequences by the two halves of the European continent. A second, more specific form of historicization would aim at the proper contextualization of the, in retrospect, largely unfounded optimism of the 1990s, an optimism that was especially evident in the later years of that decade. It was this short-lived optimism following the unexpected end of the Cold War that made decision-makers on both sides of the former Cold War divide assume that the European Union could be smoothly widened and deepened at the same time. This spirit of optimism was coupled, and here we obviously see another major legacy of the Cold War, with high levels of mutual ignorance and resulting misperceptions between the two sides. They in turn helped strengthen rather facile theories of westernization and Europeanization that naively assumed that Eastern specificities could soon be overcome. In sum, exploring the decades since 1989 from a historical point of view, it is that brief moment of simultaneous trust in positive forms of convergence, coupled as that trust was with largely sustained ignorance and often barely veiled arrogance on the Western side and inferiority complexes and overblown expectations on the Eastern one, which would require further attention now, rather than the fact that this simultaneous trust, trust has largely evaporated on both sides since. I would like to thank you for your attention.